All right, so today's our last day of like just raw Mesozoic diversity, basically Jurassic and Cretaceous stuff today, so not really the whole Mesozoic. But some of these interesting groups of tetrapods that have returned to the oceans, you guys have already met because they did that in the Triassic. And so before I just kind of jump into the lecture, I thought you could like take a second, talk to your neighbors, look at this awesome painting, see anything, what do you recognize? Anybody familiar? Do you know what kind of fishes those are? I know that you do. But, you know, in a big sense, what is familiar to you, what isn't? Just do that for a quick second. This is the Jurassic Ocean, by the way, in Europe. yeah all right anything fun people want to point out i like this lecture it's just full of cool animals we were curious about the tail the tail on the fly store Oh, the pliosaur, look at this. That's this one is it's kind of a circle on the pliosaur. And what are you curious about? Oh, I just thought they had a more wholesome tail. No, so a lot of these plesiosaurs we'll talk about today, plesiosaurs are driven by like limb locomotion, which is very weird. Most marine tetrapods, most marine organisms that are vertebrates are, yeah, caudally driven. They flap their tails around. <laughs> this is a crocodile that has flippers instead of hands and kind of flippers instead of feet. And it absolutely is caudally propelled. It has a big tail fin. But this big plesiosaur, which is a completely different kind of reptile, flies with its four arms and legs. Yeah, Westy. You know, you know how it jumps out of the water and it's very like a shark in the Jurassic movie? <laughs> That's a different animal. Is it? That's the, the, you're the one from the Jurassic World movies is not on here. The one in the Jurassic World movies, uh, we'll see it later, but it's a Cretaceous thing. Totally different. Do they do like the bad animal get that big though? Like as big as it is in the Jurassic World? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> they do a little plus 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 on that. But I mean, you know, that was a product of uh, a corporate amusement park. So maybe they made it as big as they wanted. <laughs> All right. So there's some fun stuff. I hope you enjoyed these. And if you don't know what they are, don't worry. I think they're one of the best things here. So there's a lot going on in the oceans, as you guys well know. You've now seen these slides a bunch of times, um, our summary slides for the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. We've been really terrestrial for like the last several weeks, even before spring break, right? Talking about dinosaurs, mostly, and then talking about all the other animals, the amphibians, the mammals, the squamates, the turtles, all the things that are happening on land. So now thinking about the Jurassic again, this time of Pangea is breaking up. Uh, we're getting these like southern continents, northern continents, some oceans in between. The Jurassic and the Cretaceous together are very stable ecosystems for a very, very, very long period of time. There's a huge amount of time if you put these two periods together where we can see turnover events that are modest, they're measurable, but nothing that we call a mass extinction event really in this two periods. So this like arc of time in Earth history is incredible. It's very long lived. A lot of plates go the whole way through it. And so in the oceans, these are, for the most part, sunny, warm ocean waters the world over. There are not polar ice caps, almost certainly at all, in the Jurassic. Um, and then things that happen in the marine ecosystems in terms of tetrapods, you guys know that in the Triassic, there was tons of evolution of tetrapods into the oceans. Many of those clays didn't make it out of the Triassic, but some of the ones that do, things like these ichthyosaurs, the dolphin lizards, or the plesiosaurs, some of them have the long necks, some of them don't, they make it through and are very, very diverse. So then you get turtles, lizards, crocs, all kinds of other animals going into the oceans after that. And a lot of that starts to happen in the Jurassic. So you guys have seen this slide, like I said before. Here's that same big giant fish from the title slide. We'll talk about it. And here's one of these things that might be a predator of it, these giant marine reptiles flapping with their arms and legs. That's a really awesome pairing of organisms. 
That's land. You've seen it. We won't talk about it. In the Cretaceous, we're kind of continuing on that same story. I guess what I'd say is the Cretaceous is the time of like maximum inundation of the continents by the oceans. Tons and tons and tons of continent are covered with shallow seaways in the Cretaceous. So we have a really, really, really good fossil record of ocean ecosystems in this time because those rocks are now exposed in places we can go to very easily. And so we've joked about this a few times in this class, but like some of the most well-known fossil oceans in the world are in Kansas today, which is really fun. Um, in terms of ocean stuff uh, in the Cretaceous, increasingly modern, that's kind of always been the theme in this class. I think some of the scariest marine reptiles are all together in the Cretaceous. So like, I like to scuba, I like to snorkel. I think doing it in the Cretaceous would be like a little bit too much because I think saltwater crocodiles today are like actually very scary organisms. And there's so many more things like that that are so much bigger than that <laughs> in the Cretaceous. And then what's interesting is you guys have already seen a few things, but there's, mer there's uh, more turtles, there's birds, there's snakes that go marine in the Cretaceous. One of those snake lineages is still alive right now which is pretty cool. So these marine invasions by terrestrial amniotes, terrestrial vertebrates happens again and again and again. Lots of cool stuff happening with the fishes, sharks, and osteotheans, of course. There's the land stuff. We've talked about it a lot. You guys have heard me talk about flowering plants. So we'll leave it for now. But just to remind you, here's where we're going today. The oceans of the Jurassic, the oceans of the Cretaceous. So let's start things off kind of back, 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 back. When was the last time I made you look at sharks or cartilaginous fishes? It's been a long time. And so the last time we saw them, you guys have learned about these hybodonts, these like sharks that have these little fins uh, that are led with these spines. They show up way back in the Paleozoic and they go all the way through the Mesozoic. Hybodont sharks go all the way to the boundary and then they do go extinct there at the top of the Cretaceous when the asteroid impact happens. When we last saw elasmobranchs, Neoslachii is the taxonomic name for the crown group of elasmobranchs. These are the living cartilaginous fishes that are most famous, most well-known. The only time in this class when I've used the word sharks straight up on the, on the slide, sharks, and then things like rays. And so you guys saw them in the Triassic, and we talked about Triassic oceans, because I showed you like the living diversity of all these different elasmobranchs. And so they both lineages are going around here through the Jurassic, through the Cretaceous. Here's a pretty gnarly piece of paleo art, just like I did before. I have you enjoy that for a second. <laughs> see if you can see everything that's happening in there. Every time I look at this, I always see something that I didn't notice at first because it's pretty fantastic. It is intense. So there's lots and lots of interesting shark evolution that happens here. Some of the biggest sharks in Earth history are not actually during this time. They're in our era, surprisingly. But there are great big sharks that are quite scary all throughout these oceans. And so here's a few squalacorax, Cretozorina, feasting on this dead plesiosaur. So it's, you know, today when it's a big dead whale floating in the ocean, people can go like with their drones and take video footage of all the great white sharks coming and eating all the blubber. I think it's fun to imagine one of these giant marine reptiles dying and all the sharks gathering around that. Uh, when I first uh, put this picture up on the slide, I actually totally missed that there's a mosasaur. This is a lizard that we're going to talk about later. That's what's in Jurassic World is one of these mosasaurs. And then you guys have met Ichthyornis here a bunch of times, that bird with the keeled sternum that still has teeth that we always find out in ocean rocks, probably living like a gull. And so it's fun to see these now very familiar sharks. Some of the sharks that you guys were seeing back in the Paleozoic were like vaguely sharky. They, you know, you can tell they're a shark from distance. These are now the animals that are part of the crown group. Uh, they look a lot like the kinds of sharks we do have today, absolutely still. There's plenty of other really cool chondrichthians. So when we were in the Triassic, you guys saw a lot of the diversity, a lot of those flat kinds of sharks and rays, things like stingrays, things like sawfish, things like saw sharks. This is one of these really famous fossil animals, Oncochristus. It's big, it's like four meter long sawfish. Um, beautiful thing. This is a fossil of the little uh, sensory teeth things it has on the end of its long rostrum. Really fun, really cool diversity, but we're not gonna spend too much time talking about but I wanted to show you this one because this is what I like about paleontology. This is what I like about fossils. This thing really knocked everybody's socks off. It came out in 2021. It's called a kilo lamna, which is the eagle shark. It has humongous pectoral fins. Uh, and it seems to probably have a filter feeding ecology, which is really fun. So this was the cover of a journal. I think it was science uh, when it came out. A lot of controversy about the specimen because it's a Mexican fossil that was probably not taken from Mexico in a way that was totally above board. So that's a bit of a controversy scientifically, 
but I think we can all appreciate how unbelievably cool an animal like this is. This is an animal that's probably related in terms of shark diversity today to things like great white sharks and basky sharks and things like that. Um, I was at Fifth Street Bakery when I was on Twitter and I saw this come out and I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> this is a cool, cool animal. No one has a shark like that today that's probably flying and swimming too. There's no pectoral fin, there's no dorsal fin? No, there's huge pectoral fin. No, no, pelvic, no pelvic, fin. Fin. pelvic Yeah, no pelvic fin. On the specimen, there's not like there's much of a pelvic fin. And yeah, it doesn't look as much of a dorsal fin either. So there's these huge serrata trichia that make up the fin rays on a chondrichthyan. So <laughs> it's pretty weird. Right? All right, let's talk about some other fishes. Um, when we go over to R, when once we're in the bony fishes, the osteichthyans, see if you guys' brain can like creak open and remember these words. The bony fishes, on one side you have the sarcopter regions, the low fin fishes, besides the tetrapods, right? There's a couple groups of sarcops, the uh, coelacanths and the lung fishes. I really don't want to focus on them too much. They just keep on keeping on. They are still around today and there's plenty that happen. But there's a few lineages of, a uh, few species, I should say, of coelacanths and lung fishes, both in fresh water, um, that are really, really fun. Uh, that I want to show you just because they're huge. So here's a, one of the largest lungfish of all time and one of the largest coelacanths of all time, Mossonia and Neoceratidus. These animals are all found in the same habitats as that sawfish I just showed you, that big one with the big spikes coming off of its nose. These are from deposits in like North Africa where these big, probably aquatic, big dinosaurs like Spinosaurus are. And so these are always reconstructed with that Cool, cool fauna. And so I just like reminding you guys the whole time we talk about all these other groups of organisms, things like coelacanths, which you've been seeing since the Devonian, keep doing cool stuff, keep showing up, are still coelacanths. Um, this is the tooth plate of that great big lungfish. And so you can hold it in your hand like this. And so they crush up stuff with their crushing teeth, that big lungfish. And so they're still doing cool stuff. Fun things are happening. But now we have to talk about the teleos because these are the actinopterygians, right? The actinopterygians is everything on this slide. This is the other half of the um, osteichthyans, the bony fishes that you guys hope remember from the Paleozoic. Many, many, many of the actinopterygian diversifications that have happened in Earth history, you guys have already seen. This one's in the Devonian. This one's in the Carboniferous and Permian. These two are in the Triassic. And then we met back in our Triassic Oceans lecture, the Teleos, which is the major, major, major diversification of Actinopterygians today. Like not, well, way more than a third, but not quite a half of all vertebrates today are these Teleos. And you guys learned a few snake morphics for Teleos, right? They have the pharyngeal jaws, the homocircle tails, a mobile premaxilla. And so what I like about this, and you're welcome, of course, to read like the text, is that there are Teleos fossils, stem group Teleos that we get in the Triassic and throughout the Jurassic. But the actual diversification of the crown group of most of today's vertebrate species, which are these teleos fishes, is in the Jurassic with most of the major groups not showing up as themselves until really close to the end of the Mesozoic. And so why don't you take a quick second and talk to your neighbors. Do you recognize some of these teleos? This is a lot of very famous kinds of fishes that I've tried to pick, at least up there. Uh, anything surprising about the phylogeny? And what do you think about the fact that they're distributed in time like this with so many of them showing up pretty near the end of the Mesozoic? So go ahead and look at that phylogeny for a second and talk to your neighbors. I think a lot of specialization and yeah, at least with the ex extreme yeah. stuff. Do you wonder if the stem might have just the wrong seed? Yeah. How many spiders are you so far in revolution? Yeah. 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 And yeah, yeah. Or the yeah, yeah. Or the two, yeah, we'll see that. It's just, 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 it
So I can tell you guys that uh, in terms of the phylogeny of the teleos, this is also a like hotbed of research right now. And only, I don't even think I would even say it's kind of settled. There's a lot of robust data now to make a phylogeny, but for the most part, we are still in like the very early days of solidifying around a true, huge, 25,000 species good phylogeny of these animals, which is really cool. And it's all based on molecular, it's all based on DNA to make these phylogenies. And so there's all these relationships that have come out in the last few years that everybody like can't really believe, but everything in the proteins, everything in the DNA agrees with it. Things like seahorses and tuna, being part of the same subset of teleos. That's really fun. Um, many of the, the animals I'm putting up here on the slide are living species, right? These aren't necessarily the species that are present back in the Cretaceous, but they're representing their lineages. I really like you guys seeing this because I think it's really fun to think about things like tuna or salmon or goldfish or whatever you want are like way younger than alligators or platypus or the idea of like ducks. <laughs> That's surprising, I think, to people. There's always been fish for the last 500 million years, I grant you that. But the fishes, the big clades of living orders of fishes that we have today on the planet are relatively new balloons, um, rel in, um, even compared to other vertebrate clades. Anything else that you guys were talking about uh, when you see this? I know it's hard to look at all these fishes and I'm like way into fishes, but I'll pull back. Looks like it's some on it, but a really long ghostly image. So they seem to be early divergent of phylogeny, but we don't see them until the very Yeah, and they don't really have good record till the Cenozoic anyway. Um, and so there's other things, other things I could have put on here. If you guys know your fishes, things like trout and salmon uh, are related to things like pike and muskie are in that group too, if you know your fishes. Uh, if this was comparative anatomy, we would have done a lot more on these fishes. And I just feel bad to be like, <laughs> bye. <laughs> But um, this is the point I want you guys to have is their, is their spread through time. I think that's really cool that clades like this one, clades like the South salmon and their relatives compared to like the reed fish, which you guys met, and its lineage goes, you know, down into the floor. Very, very different. And so here's kind of some uh, data to back up a little more of what I'm saying instead of just my little cartoons. These are figures from a real paper. And so here's the phylogeny of Teleos. You might recognize some of these outlines. You definitely probably don't recognize most, and that's fine. Most people don't think about fish a whole lot. <laughs> but here's the Jurassic, and here's the Cretaceous in blue and in green, highlighted on this phylogeny. This is a molecular phylogeny, again, based on DNA. And so I'm curious what you guys can observe about the radiations of the living groups of Teleos relative to geological time. Go ahead and talk to your neighbors about that uh, just for a little bit. Uh, so little, the clades of these triangles, right? The red and the blue triangles are like the living orders. Yeah. 
So remember, this has got no fossils in it. It's totally molecular. But what kind of observations do we have? We have questions. What's the red and the blue supposed to be? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> are those families that we're seeing listed on the orders? Orders. Those are orders. Yeah, there's a lot of fishes. <laughs> I have to remember the difference between blue and green that they're trying to illustrate. Uh, Percomorph. Percomorph fishes are all red here, and that's like been since like Linnaeus, like a big pile that's obviously way too many and not been differentiated enough. So I'm sure that's what the red is supposed to be, but I don't remember off the top of my head. How about the colored triangles? Where are they in time? I don't show up uh, after Cretaceous. Almost every single one of these triangles is contained to like our era past the Cretaceous period. And so one point I tried to make to you guys when we were in the Triassic was we looked at like the we a couple a couple other fish papers where you saw like the phenotypic diversity of like the Gar relatives, the te early Teleos relatives, the crown Teleos relatives that are all in like the Triassic and the Jurassic. And the point was is like there's no clear pattern of like phenotypic diversity. So today, teleosts are like so diverse. Oh my God, everything the teleosts in the oceans. But it's not like back in the Triassic, back in the Jurassic, those fishes take over the oceans. And the diversity we have today is that original teleost diversity. It almost seems like throughout the last 250, 300 million years, you always have oceans full of morphologically and phenotypically disparate crazy fishes, flying fishes, things like that. But taxonomically, they just keep evolving the same body plans and the same patterns again and again and again and again. And so these are urinized fishes. When we go around the world and scuba dive or go fishing, these are what we're going to see. And there's fishes that are probably a lot like all of these back in the Cretaceous and the Jurassic as fossils that aren't necessarily part of these groups at all. So there's a big mass extinction right here. We'll talk about it on Thursday, the asteroid impact. And you can see how like these fishes all go pretty much after that. And so there's diversifications we can infer in the Cretaceous quite a bit, I think you'd agree, and some in the Jurassic also. Um, but we would need fossils to really understand the anatomical transitions there. Is this figure arguing that teleosts originated in the earliest Permian? It's not arguing that. It's just molecular people who don't care about fossils. So they just do their little thing. We talked about it yesterday with birds. We talked about it yesterday with mammals, where they will take a phylogeny, assume a random or a constant rate of molecular evolution, and then they just put a date on there. So that's what they say. But then we all go, no. And they go, OK, so we have to figure it out. But this is just a molecular paper. So they care about the interrelationships. And they, of course, Gary's correct to notice the teleos note is here. And that's like, no, thank you. I put it there. <laughs> um, but that's OK. That's just their model. What matters to me is like all these crown group things I do trust uh, pretty well. When farther you go back, the wonkier it gets. Anyway, these are the fishes I'll subject you to. I just think it's interesting and fun. Think about these things. Fishes amongst vertebrates are pretty much the ultimate uh, evolutionary biology question answerers because there's so many of them and they do so many things. Yeah. Um, so if you included extinct orders on here, how much more would there be? Oh, a lot more. Uh, and what's tough is there's a few extinct orders that I'll show you a few of them here in a second. Uh, but there's also a lot of taxa that it's like hard to know where they fit into the phylogeny of the living groups. The morphology is like all these all these orders that diversify after the asteroid impact. That evolution happened so quickly, it's hard to know if like similar fishes here are their relatives or if it's the same anatomy evolving again and again. So it could be really hard to pull apart. Like uh, and then synthesize the taxonomy of fossil fishes from the, like the Jurassic say, and then the taxonomy of the living groups. Pretty difficult. I'll show you a few, some fun teleos. This is my slide of cool Mesozoic teleos. These are fishes that we have some idea of where they go, but they almost always come out as like pretty early diverging teleos, not deeply within the big group. Just some fun stuff. How do you like that dorsal fin? 
I like it. Uh, one of the most famous teleos is this animal, Sefactinus, called the bulldog fish. It can get quite big. I think the biggest ones are like uh, 15, 16, 18 feet, maybe. Uh, they have these really gnarly, like bulldog faces full of teeth. Uh, these are the fishes that people find the most of in Kansas. The people that actually work at the museums in Kansas are always like angry on Twitter because they find another Sefactinus and then they have to dig it up and it's a 15 foot long fish. <laughs> But it's a big predator. Uh, some of them have been found with stomach contents. So here's one gobbling up one of those birds that you guys have met with like the long fins. Sebactinus so has uh, a whole lot of other fishes that are related to it um, that look kind of like it. Uh, I really like this fossil. This is a very famous fossil of this uh, interesting teleos that has this like long hooky nose. There's a lot of fishes today that have like some sort of extension of their upper jaw or their lower jaw. It's usually useful in catching prey. You can think of things like swordfish. There's other things called um, like garfish, not actually gar. Uh, this fossil has a lot of heavy duty scales on it, but it's a famous fossil of this fish called Spinorhynchus because the beak is like impaling a little pterodactyl, a little pterosaur, which is kind of fun. So there's a, a pterosaur right here that uh, this fish tried to eat and was not successful. And now they're both fossil together forever. <laughs> uh, these are some of my favorite uh, big teleos from the Mesozoic. Uh, this one's called Bonerichthys. You're seeing that's the eyeball, a lot of the skull bones, the gill structure, the lower jaw, big pectoral fin. And then here's one of the largest ones, this fish called Leedsichthys, diver for scale. These are some of these fishes that are about 40 or 50 feet long. They are actinopterygian fishes. They are teleost fishes. They are gigantic filter feeders. You can think about them as being very whale-like back in these oceans before there's any mammals at all going out into the oceans. And so the fishes on the title slide that were in the background there with their mouths open really wide were these huge teleos. That's a fish I would swim with. I hope you guys would swim with it too. <laughs> some of them are big, some of them are smaller. Elite Zikthys is easily uh, the largest one. And so again, that ecology of filter feeding evolves constantly because the oceans have, for many hundreds of millions of years, been constantly full of floating little organisms. And if you could scoop them all up and rake them out of the water in some way, using your gills, using your baleen, which is what whales will end up doing, there's ways for you to harvest a lot of really easy food. So here's a gigantic fish, body size. By the way, this is its little pelvic fin. <laughs> anyway, cool whale kind of thing of the Actinopterygians. And so this is a figure uh, that I really like talking about the evolution of filter feeding amongst fishes. Uh, within the context of the end of the Mesozoic and into our era, the Cenozoic. And so these, are, these authors have two different categories, a kilopelagic filter feeders, that means eagle pelagic, so these ones that are like flying with their mouths open. And so you guys met this shark already, a kilo lamina, down here in the Mesozoic. We think they have a range that goes most of the Mesozoic, and this is where a kilo lamina itself is actually from. And then here's these fishes called pachycormids, these actinopterygians that are open, opening their mouths, pushing water across their gills, and almost certainly filter feeding because of their lack of teeth and gigantic size, which is really cool. Those two ecologies should be familiar to you because today there's plenty of fishes that do exactly what these fishes are doing. And so mantas today, you can see there's some extinct groups we don't have any. But mantas today are doing what something like Aquila Lambda did back then in the Cretaceous, flying around with their pectoral fins, swooping with their mouths open and scooping up all the plankton. And then here's three completely different shark groups today that are doing basically what this giant Actinopterygian was doing back in the Cretaceous, swimming around with their big tail fins, pushing water over their gills and filtering out a lot of organisms, basking sharks, whale sharks. And if you don't know this one, it's called a mega mouth shark. It's pretty cool. So again, I think something that is fun for you guys to think about is the like repeated evolutions of different organisms that share certain levels of the same anatomy and how they convergently like do the same things over time. I love it constantly. And if you've never seen a basking shark, here's a basking shark with a mouth open. Picture from off of Ireland, I'm almost certain. And so that's this animal right here. So when you think about whales a lot, when we think about vertebrates and filter feeding, but really fishes do it all the time. So here's this shark with its mouth open, the water goes out the gills, and it's got these breakers in front of the gills. So before it breathes, it scoops out all the plankton and then swallows up that plankton, which is pretty cool. Also, basking sharks are super helpful for when you talk about the evolution of jaws and the evolution of gills and how they're connected, because it's like, anyway. All right, let's get into the tetrapods, because I know I've been subjecting you to fishes, fishes, fishes. So we saw in our lab on marine reversions that all over this tree, especially amongst the amniotes, 
There are plenty, 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 plenty of times when amniote lineages jump back into the oceans. And some of the coolest animals in the Mesozoic are absolutely these kinds of animals. And so you've already met ichthyosaurs, and you already kind of saw plesiosaurs back in the Triassic. These are both lineages of reptile that go into the ocean way back then. And so we saw this slide. Here's that same phylogeny, but now scaled for time. Our crown group reptiles are here. So here's our archosaurs, all of our crocs and turtles and birds and dinosaurs. Here's our lizards, snakes, the tuatara, the lepidosaurs. And so we think probably these plesiosaurs are related to the lizards today inside the crown group of reptiles. Ichthyosaurs are a little more mysterious. They're probably outside the crown group. But either way, both going into the water in the Triassic. And so when we had this slide, which you guys have already seen, this is a slide talking about the end Triassic mass extinction, made the point of how much you know, interesting stuff we lost in the Triassic, including a lot of marine clades. But there were two marine reptile clades that made it through the Triassic, and you could see go through much of the rest of the Mesozoic. These are these ichthyosaurs and these plesiosaurs. And so if you remember when we talked about ichthyosaurs, kind of in the early parts of the Triassic, they're small, then they get quite big, but most of the ichthyosaurs throughout the Triassic are just kind of like sinuous animals. Gary talked to you about his big shastosaur ichthyosaurs. But by the end of the Triassic, you get this true like dolphin-y body plan that really settles in. And all the ichthyosaurs pretty much in the Jurassic and certainly going into the Cretaceous are these very dolphin-y animals. But the big dorsal fin, a big caudal fin, they are the reptile equivalent, you know, of dolphins, you can really think of it as. And I hope you remember they have these absolutely ridiculous fins with many fingers and many, 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 many digits within those fingers, all fused to make giant paddle limbs. And so those are those ichthyosaurs that you've already seen. So let's talk about ichthyosaurs in the rest of their time. So in the Jurassic and in the Cretaceous. Uh, why don't you check, take a quick second. What do you observe about these two skeletons? Or what do you have a question about when you see these two skeletons or skulls? there should be all right so what's something that jumps out right away about these ichthyosaurs Big eyes. Big eyeballs. I think it's the best. And so they don't just have big eyeballs. They have the biggest eyeball. Um, and so here's relative eye size for their body size. And so things like Temnonontosaurus, which is this taxon right here, absolutely have like the biggest eyeballs you can have pretty much. Even things like giant squids and whales are different. Ophthalmosaurus is a teeny tiny little ichthyosaur. Um, and it has humongous eyeballs. And so we wonder about ichthyosaurs and their diving abilities. By the time we're in the Jurassic, ichthyosaurs are at their like, most diverse. There's lots of different body forms. We're going to see a couple of them here in a second. And so these are breathing organisms, right? They are reptiles. They have to go up to the surface and go and then go back down. They don't have gills. Um, but we wonder about some of them having a very deep sea ecology. There's plenty of animals that you would call squids or squid relatives. That have, some of them have shells, some of them don't. So there's a lot of food to eat down there in that deep water, probably also just fishes too. And so having these gigantic eyes with these huge sclerotic rings, these are bones that are set into the eyes. Many organisms today have sclerotic rings. Um, it's something that helps hold the eye steady. The iris is right here in the middle, so you can see out. And so going down to deep pressures and things like that, with big eyes that can let in as much light as possible, that's a really interesting idea. Some of these animals have really delicate, long jaws with very tiny, sharp, pointy teeth. They're probably grabbing things like squids and fishes. Some of these animals have relatively short faces with absolutely massive raptorial heavy duty teeth. They're probably eating other big animals. Temnodontosaurus is one of these ones that's probably eating pretty big prey. It's often compared to like orca today. It's about the same body size and orcas take down other big animals. They don't just gobble up little fishes and squids. And so with those big dark eyes, there's always these fun artists who do things like this, where you imagine, you know, Temnodontosaurus down in the depths, and there it is catching a plesiosaur that was also trying to eat the squids. And I think that's nice and fun to think about. 
<laughs> uh, here's what I mean when I say there's lots of different diversity of their body types. This is a big animal. This is an over 20 foot long animal called Urinosaurus. That's a fossil of one in Seattle. And so this is an animal that like, don't you just dislike that this is a reptile? That's not a fish. I'll just let you look at it. Yeah. <laughs> and people modeled how fast these things went? I have to assume they have. I don't know it off the top of my head. There's been some studies done. I think I can't think of it though either. Some of them have really, like really tight, compact bodies. If there's the, if I go back to this, like this animal in particular, Thalmosaurus, I mean, this is a really big caudal fin on a really short little stubby body. So most fishes that have that kind of architecture are like very fast paddlers that could be really quick in the water. So these animals, once they go into the Jurassic and the Cretaceous are like very, the word is fusiform, these like bullet shaped bodies, very, very adept in the water. These are very extreme adaptations to a marine lifestyle. Again, from a terrestrial ancestor, ichthyosaurs are coming from something that would have looked sort of lizard-like back in the Permian. And here they are looking like this once we're into the later parts of the Mesozoic, which is pretty amazing. It's got a lot like what whales would do uh, later in time. Okay, that's all I was going to say about ichthyosaurs today, because there's a lot of other clades of stuff that goes into the water. So now let's get into this one. These are these sauropterygians that have the plesiosaurs inside in the reptile crown. You saw this slide again already when we did our Triassic Oceans lecture. And so there's all these interesting groups of these shell-crushing placodonts, these sea lion-like nothosaurs. They live and die. They, they diversify and go extinct in the Triassic. But near the end of the Triassic, one of these clades of sauropterygians starts this lineage called the plesiosaurs. And so here's some of these really early plesiosaurs. And you can see they're very different from the ichthyosaurs. And they're locomoting in a way that's almost completely unique among marine tetrapods. Sea turtles kind of use their arms today as like, well, they don't kind of, they definitely do, use their arms today as their primary locomotion. You know, there's no sea turtle moving its tail to swim through the water. But for the most part, these animals do something that no other tetrapod group has done, which is they take all four of their limbs, that's a humerus, that's a femur, and they make these almost equivalent to each other in their details, paths that they fly with. Really, really, really incredible adaptation for swimming around. And then, yeah, not using their tails, not being caudally locomoted. And so once we get into the Jurassic, these animals spread all over the place. They're found in world oceans on every continent. And so here's a big phylogeny of all these different plesiosaurs all throughout the Jurassic, all throughout the Cretaceous. There's a lot of body plans that sort of show up in plesiosaur evolution again and again and again and again. I always kind of think of it as there's this like baseline plesiosaur that has this nice heavy like shoulder girdle and belly ribs and pelvis. And then these four big paddles, kind of a long neck, but not that long of a neck. And you see that body plan kind of throughout the tree in different places. But then there's an extreme thing that happens a couple of different times convergently. One is a pliosaur type body plan, and the other one is an elasmosaur type body plan. Uh, they show up multiple times, but only two that are really extreme. When I say pliosaur, that's these guys, where you can see the neck is relatively shorter and the head is absolutely huge. The pliosaurs, I think, are some of the scariest animals that have ever existed. They are humongous, and they have huge mouths full of teeth. Whereas you can see this kind of plesiosaur, and it's a lasmosaur body plan where they have a very, very, very long neck. This is a single specimen that's known from Canada. You can go see it on display if you go up to Alberta. There's a, that's a five meter scale bar on that animal. And so this is a swimming organism, of course, but it has this like sauropod style, long, long, long neck. Unlike the sauropods though, that you guys met, those dinosaurs with long necks, there's not all these like special processes and adaptations to hold the neck up because it's an aquatic organism, it's always in the water, it's neutrally buoyant. So that neck is extremely long. And so the couple of evolutions of like relatively long necks, a couple of evolutions of relatively huge heads kind of throughout the plesiosaur tree. And that's made it really complicated for people that study these animals to sort out their phylogeny. Uh, they're for sure, almost completely all predators of big or small organisms. There's no evidence of anything other uh, diet wise other than predation in these organisms. But obviously they must have very different requirements if you have a body like this and a head like that versus a body like this and a head like that. So interesting things to think about. Just some cool plesiosaur stuff. Uh, go ahead and talk to your neighbors about this slide just for a second and enjoy it because these are great organisms. It's like if I can summon up in a word destruction. 
So we'll see that in the Our greatest is skull. Look at this guy's face. That's a good face. <laughs> yeah. These are really awesome. That's my objective scientific opinion. Can't you imagine like rolling up in your dinghy, like off of Maui or whatever, and it's just laying there going like, flapping its fins and being lazy, and he's like, yeah, you're a nightmare. <laughs> So obvious, you know, not this is sort of like a Tyrannosaurus Rex kind of moment where like nobody really has any doubts about the macro predatory ecology of these animals. We can see these rows of teeth they have, massive up front. They kind of interlock. Uh, that's true across the clade and a bunch of different kinds of these pliosaurs. Um, and again, imagine them moving through the water and they're going like this to move around, arms and legs. They're not going side to side with their bodies. Their body itself is probably quite rigid. It's only their arms and legs moving as they go through the water like this. What does it mean for these things to hunt? What is it like? How fast can this thing go? I don't actually know the answer to that. And I don't know if people really do, but that's really something, 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 something to think about. Uh, here's uh, some of my favorites. I love elasmosaurs. This is a mounted skeleton of elasmosaurus. You can see its teeth. These animals are almost certainly predators of like things like squids and tiny fishes. They have the very, very long interlocking teeth when the jaw is shut and the teeth are like this. There's a beautiful elasmosaur skull on display at the museum down campus. Some of you guys might've seen it. Uh, and they have these really wonderful interlocking teeth. People have wondered for a long time what the deal with these necks could possibly be. They are not pneumaticized or structural like we talked about with those long-necked dinosaurs. They're just long reptile necks. And so some ecology people reconstruct sometimes is like getting their heads like into schools of fishes while the mass of their body is actually quite far away and then gobbling, you know, fish like this. Interesting, maybe, hard to know for sure. This is that animal Alberta nectes from Canada. I'm giving you a little more detail so you can see just how humongo it really is. I think these animals are spectacular representatives of like life on earth and really again, challenge what we could expect things to do. Again, this is a reptile. This is an animal that has a lizard-like ancestor um, and they live for quite a long time. Elasmosaurs are around for most of the Cretaceous. They're certainly alive up until the end when the asteroid effect happens. When you see a structure like this in biology, you can think of and try to test hypotheses about function if you want to, and you probably should. And so things like diet and getting their head into a fish school, that makes sense. But there's a lot of people that say most extreme morpho morphologies you get today, most really extreme morphologies have something to do with like other kinds of selection than survival. Maybe sexual selection. Because sexual selection makes most of the stuff that looks ridiculous in the world is sexual selection. And so we have no idea if that's possible. We don't, we don't see things like dimorphism in these animals in terms of their long necks. So who knows? But I like people who think about biology like that. And this is one of my favorite pieces of paleo art. This is an elasmosaur lecking ground somewhere in the middle of the ocean <laughs> where you have males coming up and just like putting their heads way up in the air. Females come and check them out. I have no way to tell you if that's real or not, but that's a good biology thought. And I really, really, really like it. They're just dancing. Okay, think about it. Some other plesiosaur stuff that's worth you guys knowing is there's plenty of evidence in different plesiosaurs of live birth. So one question that always comes up when we talk about marine reptile evolution, we're talking about marine mammal evolution, is how are you gonna be reproducing? A mammal has a live baby for the most part. And so, okay, you have to have your live baby in the ocean. How is that gonna be different than having your live baby up on land? We're gonna talk about that when we do whale evolution and seal and manatee evolution later in this class. 
these reptiles are reptiles, and reptiles, for the most part, as a general ancestral sense, lay eggs. You guys know sea turtles, even the biggest sea turtles today have to like laboriously pull themselves up onto a beach and dig a hole and lay their eggs, and then they leave. Some of these animals are humongous, way, 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 way bigger than things like sea turtles are today. And so decades ago, people wondered, they must be doing something other than just laying eggs, because they're just, how could they possibly? Some of these animals are like, 50 feet long almost. You're coming up onto a beach, like under the moon and digging a hole. I don't know about that. And so now we have a few different evidences of live birth, which is really cool. Remember that these animals are related to Lepidosaurus, so the squamates of today. Lizards, snakes do, but lizards have evolved live birth like kind of a lot of times, like many, 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 many tens of times. So having your egg hatch in your body or just having that baby be born straight up within the female reproductive tract happens all the time in living lepidosaurs. And so here is a beautiful fossil, this animal called po polycotylus. You can see it's not really that pliosaur or elasmosaur body type. It's kind of the more general body type, although it has a pretty long, delicate nose, probably snatching up little fishes. This fossil has right here, if you put all those bones together, they make a tiny little polycotylus. Something that's really cool about this biologically is if that animal gets put back together, there's evidence for just the one. And the one is quite big. That's how big this baby is in relation to the mother's body size. So this is an extremely mammalian reproductive style where you're obviously putting a huge investment into a single offspring that you're going to have live. And then do you leave it alone? I would bet a lot of money that that thing stays next to you for a year or two or something like that because you've already invested so much into it. That's how the reproduction of most animals today kind of works. Reptiles that give live birth today often do give birth to like a litter, like a large number of offspring. When you get into this type of selection where there's like very low number, single pup, you have to wonder about parental care in the aftermath of the actual birth of the organism. That is really fun and really cool. And he hits our expectations, right? Uh, it agrees, it makes sense with what we would expect the biology of these animals to have to be. So that's something. Another thing I just can't not share about plesiosaurs is this one clade of elasmosaurs. So within those really, really, really long-necked ones, there's a handful of species that seem to show a transition to a different type of feeding ecology that goes extinct right at the very, very end, and I'm so bummed about it. So this is this animal called Mortinaria. Here's a model of its skull with the jaws shut and then the mouth open in a couple different directions. Here's the skull in side view with a cross section that that line is going up through the skull. So here's the skull on the front and those are the lower jaws, that's the mandible on either side right there. That's with the mouth closed and there's with the mouth open. I hope you can see that the teeth in the dentary and the premaxilla and the maxilla all stick out fully sideways. They don't interact with each other in like a bite and bite kind of way. And so people wondered when these animals were first found, like, how are these teeth working? They might not be even functional at all. And so some people found other fossils of animals like this, and it looks like it might be a filter feeding kind of uh, adaptation, where these animals could take in a whole lot of water into their long necks, and then if they close their jaws, push all that water back out and filter feed almost in reverse, which is a lot like what whales do with baleen today, but obviously with a different scale. And so people have wrote these, written these papers that are really spectacular, Comparing whale evolution, these are whales right here, with these plesiosaurs, and we see similar changes in like, in whales, it's teeth becoming baleen, and in these animals, it's only ever teeth, to these like end Cretaceous members that have this really bizarre tooth morphology. And so it's still kind of up in the air, but are we looking at a kind of whale style filter feeding, but with a very tiny head on a huge neck instead of what whales do, which is a humongous head and a humongous like throat. I love it. I can't wait to learn more. I hope they find more fossils. Again, something I think you guys should know about because it's beautiful. All right, as we move farther up into reptiles, you guys already know from our lab that there's plenty of members of all the living reptile groups that show marine adapted members. Probably the most famous goes right there. This, Weston, is your Jurassic World animal, a mosasaur. And so a mosasaur is an actual squamate. It is within the living diversity of lizards. A mosasaur is a lizard. These two are ancient kinds of reptiles, maybe in the crown, maybe not in the crown, but they're their own things. Mosasaurs are lizards. So let's talk about mosasaurs. 
Here's the Squamate biodiversity of today. You guys saw this in our World of Dinosauria lecture last week. So this is all really well supported from DNA, and now fossils are being used to fill in some of the gaps to understand the transitions between all the different lizard groups, as well as things like the origin of snakes, which is a really intense research question. I have to tell you, it's a little bit frustrating. We know mosasaurs go here somewhere. Mosasaurs, we only have fossils. We cannot take mosasaur DNA and use it to put onto this DNA of all the squamates today. But we know they don't go with geckos or skinks or anything like that. People for a while thought they might be on the snake side of things. Not many people really believe that too hard anymore. But somewhere on this branch or this branch or right here or right here, it's where mosasaurs go. And I'll let you know if anybody ever really settles on where they are. But these are these lizards that get humongous. Easily the biggest lizards of all time are mosasaurs. So here's mosasaurs. Uh, I'll stop blabbing for a quick second because I know I have been. Uh, take in this slide, talk to your neighbors. What kind of questions do you guys have about mosasaurs? Very much secret way. Yeah, like it's not like super to All right, any comments? Obviously, you're looking at a lot of paleo art. I'm not showing you any fossils right now, but that's okay. In which one? Yeah. Oh, in this one. The only one you can see. Yeah, so this is, we're going to talk about it in a minute. This is an animal called Globodens, and it has totally like hemispherical teeth. It doesn't have sharp teeth at all. So it's probably a crusher, probably a shell eater, which is very interesting. All these animals have streptostyle, right? You guys might remember one of the features you had for squamates is that three quadrate that lets the lower jaw swing back and open really wide. So these animals have the ability to really open their mouth really big, uh, and they're very close to things like snakes and varanids, like Komodo dragons. So they have a huge gape when they want it. I love that we know where they go in the tree, and so we therefore are like pretty much 100% confident they have forked tongues, even though we're never going to find that fossil. I think that's really cool. If you guys have ever seen like a video of like a sea snake underwater on a coral reef, they'll stick their tongue out and be like snakes underwater. And I'm sure mosasaurs are doing that all the time, chemosensory smelling with their tongues, which is really cool. So these are very different than those plesiosaurs you've seen, right? These are true lizards. Here's some of these plesiosaurs fleeing for their lives right there. Um, I hope you guys have noticed also, mosasaurs show up really near the end of dinosaur time. They're basically, they show up in the end of the early Cretaceous and then they're through the rest of the late Cretaceous. They almost don't overlap with ichthyosaurs at all. The ichthyosaurs go all through the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous and very little bit into the late Cretaceous. But at that point, mosasaur evolution, the earliest mosasaur fossils we have that are still lizards really look like lizards. They're like a meter and a half long, Komodo dragon looking little animal is an early mosasaur fossil. We have a bunch of them. And so they transitioned to the water about the same time that ichthyosaurs roughly are starting to go extinct. I don't think there's any relationship there in terms of competition or anything, but it's interesting. Plesiosaurs are going around the whole time. Some plesiosaurs live with ichthyosaurs, some plesiosaurs live with mosasaurs. This turnover here. These aren't just like monoliths of these uh, Jurassic and Cretaceous ocean. 
Uh, any other observations or things people wanted to point out or questions they had? In the top left, are they depicted looking like it has scales? Do we know? Oh, yeah. I can't remember how scaly they stay. There's plenty of fossils of soft tissues of mosasaurs, and they have squamate scales. They have like lizard skin with the overlapping scales. Yeah. Uh, this is a fossil of like, uh, there's a, this paper came out a few years ago and there's like tons and tons of little tiny baby mosasaur fossils, like little tiny jaws full of teeth. And so we think these have live birth and then also have like huge litters. So very much unlike that, these are that has the one big pup, um, which is really interesting. Some of these mosasaurs are quite big. This is the one of the big ones, Mosasaurus. This is the one that's in the Jurassic World movie. And like they're in like the 40 feet-ish plus range. They're not 80 feet long or anything like that. They can't... Uh, one bite of great white shark, I'm sorry to tell you. Um, but they are pretty big, scary lizards. These are obviously very much caudal propulsion. They flap their tails side to side and they have great big caudal fins. Like ichthyosaurs, their tails are hypocircle. The vertebrae go down into the ventral lobe of the tail and then there's a soft tissue structure off the top to make their big tail fin. And so they're sweeping that side to side to move through the water. These little guys swimming away are using all four arms and legs, right, to swim away. And so I like mosasaurs kind of for a lot of reasons. Uh, historically, these are some of the earliest, earliest, earliest fossils that at least Western science ever found and recognized. This is an etching from the 1780s of uh, Dutch uh, chalk beds being excavated. And these people found this monster called the Maastricht monster. The end stage of the Cretaceous is called the Maastrichtian, which is named for this little place in the Netherlands called Maastricht, where they were excavating chalk beds. And so this fossil, that's the denary right there full of teeth, was found like, you can think of it as like Revolutionary War-ish time. And this is one of the first animals that had scientists, which they weren't even called scientists back then, right? In the 1700s, being like, what is this? We don't have anything like this. Is this like a sea serpent, I guess? And so the idea of extinction wasn't really around until about 1800. And this animal is one of the ones that really made some of these Western scientists kind of freak out because no one knew what it was, the Maastricht monster. I also like the Maastricht monster because like after it gets found, it goes to the museum. I forget which, well, not a museum, there's no museum. It goes somewhere in the Netherlands and like in the early 1800s, Napoleon takes it. Uh, and so if you want to see this fossil, it's in Paris and it still is in Paris because Napoleon took it real early. <laughs> anyway. Mosasaurs have been around a long time. We knew about mosasaurs before we knew about dinosaurs. And so this is a 19, like early 20th century, I'm sorry, reconstruction of one of the mosasaurs, Tylosaurus. You can see all these fun things they've added, like these like fins on the back and stuff like that. Mosasaurs have been a part of paleontology as a science, paleontology like iconography for hundreds of years. I think that's really cool. We now know a lot more about them. So to answer the questions you guys just had about their fins, about their scales, that's what a mosasaur looks like, I'm going to say now. We've got plenty of full specimens. Here's some beautiful specimens, again, from a chalk bed. So like uh, limestone kind of beds from the bottom of the ocean. It has soft tissue preservation. You can see the outline. That's the radius, the ulna right there of this hand fin. And then here's a caudal tail fin. This is like that lobe going up right there off the top of the tail. So we can see how the vertebrae bend down to make that ventral lobe. And then we can see soft tissue structure showing us the shape of that dorsal lobe. These are big, big, big lizards that in the end of dinosaur times adapted to the oceans and were very, very intense predators. There are a lot of known species of mosasaur and they are a really, really rich area of paleontological study. So here's one of these big ones. That's Tylosaurus again. This is like a 35, 40 foot animal sometimes. Very sharp teeth. This is a skull in ventral view. So this is the brain case. Here's the temporal opening. Uh, the, going up to the temporal openings from the bottom. And then you can see those teeth up there are little spheres. So this is globidens. And so sharp teeth, globy shaped teeth, probably crushing teeth. And so we actually know a whole lot about mosasaur ecology. These animals, because they're such an interesting, relatively quick adaptive radiation, like I said, have been really well studied. So here's an example of like a mosasaur fauna a place where we can find a bunch of mosasaurs all living in the same ocean. Of course, they're found alongside sharks and squids and fishes and other things too. But here's a diagram of like possible theoretical tooth shapes that could exist. And here's where different mosasaur species map out on that possible tooth shape diagram. And so is it hard prey, is it soft prey? Are you piercing it, are you crushing it? And we can see based on the morphology, get an idea of what mosasaurs are doing what. And so what I think is really cool 
is we can then take that with other bits of information you can get from the fossil record. So here's the body length of the mosasaurs. And then on the y-axis here, people are looking at isotopes to get a sense of how high or not a different mosasaur is on the trophic pyramid. So this is uh, looking at a carbon-13 isotope that's gonna be a proxy for like how high you are. It gets concentrated, right? Uh, nutrients and things like that. As you move up a trophic pyramid, toxins get concentrated as you move up a trophic pyramid. This is one proxy for getting a sense of who's eating who. And what I think is really cool is you can take body size, you can take tooth morphology, and you can take these isotopes to build like a mosasaur ecosystem. And so these crushing tooth ones are relatively low on the trophic pyramid. And they're probably eating things like oysters. And then as you go up and up and up and up, you're going up in body size as well as going down in that isotopic composition. And then when you get to these great big mosasaurs like this one here, they're reconstructed as eating other mosasaurs as well as really big fishes. They have teeth that certainly indicate they could do that. And then they are the biggest mosasaurs around. And so I just think this can be really beautiful when you get different levels, different lines of evidence coming together to help you understand the biology of like extinct ecosystems. Down here, there's some other couple of funny things, uh, diving adaptation. So a kind of like bone necrosis you might see in animals that dive down into low oxygen conditions, like basically hold their breath for a long time. And you actually see evidence for the diving in a lot of these groups. You don't see it in the one that's eating like clams and stuff. I just think that's very, very fun to come up with these different ways to reconstruct the uh, biology of these organisms. Great big predators showing you independent lines of evidence to be, yeah, great big predators. Um, there's another part of being a great big predator, especially in the oceans. You don't have to be great big for this to be true. Um, I just like showing people this. I'll let you enjoy it for yourself. Okay, so watch that again. What's happening here? <laughs> I mean, it bumps the guy in the head, and that's cute. That's not what I'm talking about. It's cute. So that great white shark that spooked that guy, and it's a boy great white shark. Look for the claspers. So that great white shark is counter shaded. Most marine predators that are predators have dark on top, it could be blue, it could be gray, it could be black, and then light on the bottom. That allows two things to happen. When you look at them from the side or from above, they disappear into the gloom of the water. And when you look at them from below, it's not as strong, but that light color helps you not see them even when they're above you. They're still casting a shadow. But if you guys think about uh, animals today, a lot of fish, orca whales, penguins, anybody in the water who's chasing other things, a lot of times counter shading, both to hide so you don't get eaten and to hide so you can sneak up on stuff is super common. I'll show it to you one more time because I just like it a lot. I would freak out. You can't plan that. <laughs> so let's think about counter shading. Uh, there was a study that came out three years ago that looked at melanosomes. So the organelles inside of cells that contain pigments and there was well-preserved soft tissue from a fossil sea turtle from the Cretaceous, from some ichthyosaurs from the Cretaceous, that animal Temnodontosaurus, actually uh, might be Stenopterygius. Uh, no, no, doesn't matter which one it is, but it's a Cretaceous one. Uh, and then a mosasaur. So here's the mosasaur scales preserved as a fossil. And here under the SCM, you can see inside to these pigment producing organelles, but we think they are. And then if you map that out onto standard, like understanding the shapes we see in the modern world, the different organelles that produce pigments, we can get a proxy for the color of these extinct marine organisms. And fantastically, the sea turtle is colored like leatherback sea turtles are today, kind of modeled. That's fun. The ichthyosaur, every part of it that they could sample was dark, which is really cool. Think about like a sperm whale, you're going down into the depths, you go up, you breathe, and then you're down because you're hunting in the dark which is very cool, very cool. And then the great big mosasaur that was in this study was countershaded. Its belly was lighter, its top was darker, just like that great white shark. And so again, I think it's really amazing how people keep getting creative and finding different ways to study these organisms and like kind of confirm things we might expect already about their biology. Blackness in a deep diving organism that we think, and then the countershading in a big predator, completely consistent with everything we see today. Pretty cool. All right, we have a little bit of time, so we'll do two more marine reptile lineages here that go into the oceans in the Mesozoic. 
There's of course sea turtles, and there are of course these sea crocodile things that go in. So I'll talk about the crocs first, because they're in the Jurassic and in the early part of the Cretaceous. So none of these crocodiles ever had to meet a mosasaur, right? Uh, here's what they look like. These are just fun. There's a couple different radiations that go into the water. Some of them are fish eaters. Some of them are definitely big macro predators. This animal here, Dacosaurus, has an absolutely terrifying skull with great big, huge teeth. When this animal got found, it was like the cover of National Geographic because it kind of looks like a Godzilla kind of face. But that is, that's the fossil. Like, look at the mean expression. Pretty intense. And so I think these crocodiles are interesting for you guys to think about because look at the patterns you're seeing again and again and again. Both the hand and the foot becoming flippers. Yes, you've seen that many times, but I think that's the point. How many times you see it? A hypocircle tail where the vertebrae are going down into a ventral lobe and you have a dorsal process of soft tissue to make a big caudal fin. You can swoop your tail from side to side and swim through the water. Here's this beautiful fossil of this crocodile called Metriorhynchus. And you can see back here, there's where the tail goes down and that's the tail fin on this crocodile. So again, I wonder what their biology is. They must have to come up. There are no crocodiles, there are no archosaurs today that do anything with live birth. And so I wonder what these things must have done. Um, some of them are more extremely adapted to the oceans, like this one, than others. So Platysuchus probably have no trouble coming up on land. But I wonder about things like Dacosaurus. Very, very cool. So this was on one of those title slides. Again, worth knowing that there's Another exploration of the oceans by a reptile group, and a lot of the same patterns are followed. And then we'll end today talking about marine turtles. Uh, you guys might remember from the lab where we talked about marine reversals, that there were actually several times different turtle clades went into the oceans and adapted pretty heavily to the oceans. There's one in the Jurassic, these thalassochelids. They have these great big hands, huge hands to make their flippers. They go into the ocean, they live there, they ultimately go extinct. And then there's this clade, the pan chalotac. I won't even say the name because I'm getting tired. Uh, these are, this is the sea turtle lineage. And some of the biggest turtles we've ever had in Earth history are some of these giant sea turtles. Um, show you some cool pics. These ones we have to think were going in and out of the water to lay their eggs because we don't have any evidence ever of any turtle ever doing live birth. But these big ones, Archelon, have like really uh, poorly ossified or under ossified shells, which is really interesting, and they're quite a huge size. So there's that one Protostega archline. These animals are, you know, four meters across or four meters long. This is the biggest sea turtle today, a leatherback sea turtle. And so there are all kinds of different diets in sea turtles today. Some of them are grazers on plants. Some of them are eating um, predaceous on hard organisms like urchins and shells. Some of them are jellyfish specialists like the leatherback turtle. And so we see that in the fossil sea turtles too. This one, Archelon, has a great big hooked beak, which is really interesting. But what I thought I would show you today is this one, which is only a couple years old now. It just came out. I actually have never heard anybody else say the name out loud, so I don't know how to say it. But Osipecon, maybe. There's the guy, and there's that skull for scale. So the skull is like this big. There's no teeth in that skull, and it's basically a tube. The maxillae curve together like this, almost a perfect circle of a mouth. And so this animal is thought to be like a slurping sea turtle, like coming up behind animals, probably dropping something in its throat and like slurping up fishes, slurping up jellyfish. It's also huge. It would have been a turtle like on the size of these ones swimming around in the oceans. So I don't know exactly what it's doing. But anyway, sea turtles like the ones we have today, Things like the green sea turtle you might see if you went to Hawaii, things like the leatherback, both of those clades are around in the Cretaceous. Those are old radiations uh, compared to a lot of the other living groups of tetrapods we'll talk about in class. But okay, I feel like that was a big dump of ocean stuff on you guys. Um, that's all I think I have for you today. Yeah, and I will see you uh, on Thursday. Talk about the asteroid.